Hello and welcome to a special edition of Plus Politics. It is no longer news that new ministers have been sworn in and handed their different portfolios. Today on the show, we will discuss uncertain sectors of the economy, like education, security, and how we can tackle corruption in Nigeria. I'm Felicity Ezewike, and this is Plus Politics. Finally, after the long wait, new Nigerian ministers have been sworn in. Some were returned, like Babatunde Rajifashola, Rotimi Amechi, Lai Mohammed, Chris Ngiga, among others. We'll be looking at the ministers, their performances for the returning ones, and for the new ones. What is the expectation? I am joined for this segment of the program by Lulu. Legbe, thank you very much for coming on Thanks the program. And of course, Raman Adebi, thank Thanks. you so much for thank joining us. Much. Both of them are, are political analysts. Gentlemen, what is your general impression about this new cabinet? Let me start with you. Um, underwhelming, to be honest. Um, underwhelming? Yeah, it's not, it's not that different from the last... Um, yeah, I think there about 18 of them that didn't return from the last cabinet. Um, well, when I say underwhelming, the amount of time it took for them to be, maybe not appointed, but for the list to go to the Senate, you would think or you would expect, or maybe I would say you would hope that that amount of time meant that there were checks going on to bring in um, people who would at least give us some hope that, okay, this, this, these people look like they know what they're doing. And that's not to say the guys there don't. Um, there's some of them, I think, that did quite well. But when you wait, um, the election was in when, February. We didn't get a list until July. It's, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring back the same set of people, Maybe not ministers from the last cabinet, but former governors, why former senators. Why take so long, basically? Then why exactly? So why take so long? You could have the list could have been released the day after the election. It could have been released the day after inauguration. Well, it's you and I know day. that there's a lot of politicking that needs to be done in order yeah. for that list to come out. I, I get that, but my point is that's why we're where we are as a country because things that should be taken seriously are not taken seriously. I mean, look at even the process for. Um, the process that it takes to actually nominate people as ministers, as far as I'm concerned, is a ridiculous process. Because I don't understand how you nominate, whether it's 43 or 40 something people to be ministers, and not one of them has a clue which portfolio they're going to lead as at the time that they attend the Senate screening. That doesn't make any sense. So, what I mean, so on what basis is the Senate screening? They're just asking generic questions because they don't, they really don't know which portfolios they're going to head. They don't know until the day it's announced. So, I mean, look at someone like Festus Keyamu. He seemed quite convinced he was going to be the next attorney general. And looking at his background, that would make sense. Um, and then he's, I think, the Minister of State, for, state Niger for Niger Delta. Delta yeah. not to, that's not to say he, won't, he, he okay. can't do the job. But why are we putting round pegs in square holes? Put people where they can they can have the most impact based on their background, based on what they've done, based on their skills and experiences. Or you have um, the former Oshun state governor, Arag Beshola, saying, confessing, really, that he doesn't know anything about the interior ministry. And now he's interior minister. Even I know about the interior ministry. So you were interested in knowing. Well, yeah, but someone in a governmental position who has been nominated to be a minister, you would think, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he has to know every single thing about everything, but why put someone there who doesn't even have a clue? I mean, he said in his statement, in his, I think it was an interview, that the only thing he knows about the ministry is what he reads in the newspapers like everybody else, and he's the minister. Let's see, will I, uh, will I be presumptuous in saying you agree to almost what all he said? Well, uh, we're in Nigeria, we're 
where things should happen better. But we find ourselves that we're in a circle of, uh, just use the word, a chain of recycling of the same people. Yeah. And the question is, um, do, don't we have quality people, people with experiences, young people, energetic people that can bring, when you bring in new people, they bring in new ideas to the table, they, you know, they bring in their fantastic skills to the table, and the experience is good, but at in some point, you need people who are going to think differently. Okay, let me just jump in there and ask you. It can't be all gloom. Agreed, a lot of returnees yeah. and new entrants and all of that. Among those people that were returned, yeah. let me ask your candid opinion on those you think will likely perform based on their antecedent and those you think maybe are not deserving of a return. Well, uh, I think uh, about 19 of them did return and the uh, from the 14 of them that returned, excluding Mr. President as the Minister of Petroleum, you know, I find that very worrisome because why not release from the antecedent that Nigerians have experienced from him performing as a president and now had an additional portfolio as the Minister of, Pet of Petroleum? Why not release that to somebody else so that we can have a better performance in that sector? Because if you gauge from the last administration, None of them perform above average. You know, that's for my view. Because uh, is it in Gige? We've been on this platform where I had head runs with the uh, labor people across board. You know, as a minister who is meant to coordinate that, that uh, ministry, you need to be in tandem with the unit of the people. And yes, not all the time that they will look in your direction. But as a leader, your role is to bring everybody to the table, let them see the direction, the policy direction you're going. And some statement that we've heard from a lot of them, you know, that, oh, we can fix power in six months. We're four years down the line, which is <laughs> 1,400 days thereafter. Power has not been fixed. Let me bring yeah. it. OK. So, Finish your thoughts. Yeah, and then where we have our uh, doctors going abroad, and somebody saying we're exporting doctors, when even in hospitals, we don't have quality doctors to man every facility. So these are questions that are on the table. And the question is, can they perform better? They've only had an opportunity of a second chance to come and prove to Nigerians that, yes, we can do better. Because Who among these returnees are you optimistic about? The only person I'm optimistic about, to be candid, is that uh, is Raji Fashola. And I'll say why. I'll say why because it is the impact of what he's doing, people can see you know, the roads. You understand? Especially the, uh, the federal roads that are linking uh, regions to region. You know, those are the ones that people can see and they can feel. And then when you talk about the, uh, the labor, uh, the, the minimum wage is still there. Is it Chris Ngege? Ngege. The minimum wage is still there is hanging. After but, but, yeah, that, that reminds me. Wouldn't it be, make sense, of course, that the man in the eye of this should come back to help finish what he started? But, but if you notice what he did, he, you know, uh, sorry to use the word, I think he did some disservice in making that happen because if it was spontaneous and the pressure that was put on the, the Nigerian government, that minimum wage should have been a thing of the past by now. You understand? Okay, let, let's that allow is the loop. That, that yeah. would have been an indicator, uh, uh, an indicator for Nigeria to see that, oh, I think this man is, called, is good and capable for this job and it will give Nigeria the desired result that we all expect. Okay, let's allow Lulu share his thought. I know you're not extremely optimistic. Yes, you've made that very clear. But of these people that came, among the new entrants, which of them do you see some promise in? Um, well, to be honest, the ones that I see, that I think, okay, that makes sense, are, well, two that, that come off the top of my head are two that were in the last cabinet, and that's... Raji Fashola and um, the finance minister, I think Zainab, uh, Zainab Ahmed. Ahmed. Because I was quite impressed with her. She stepped in and basically stabilized everything after the exit of Kemi Adyoshu. And I think she did quite a good job with that. Um, the, the rest of them, honestly, I'm not too sure. Chris Ngigi, I'm not sure how he's still in the cabinet, to be honest. Um, you, I mean, you mentioned the fact that because he's the one that sort of um, was in charge of this minimum wage thing, then let him be the one to implement it. I disagree with that. I think it should be someone with fresh eyes 
to have a look at it because even the controversy, the, the controversy leading up to the point where a new minimum wage was finally agreed, most of it was needless, in well, my you, opinion. You know that, except the person has been an integral part of the process. The person would need another time to no. process what no. has, understand not what it is. Not necessarily, the, because... Government is a continuum. Exactly, Sorry, not yeah, necessarily. It's a continuum. So, and a fresh eye is not going to look at it from the old part of it. It's exactly, going to look at it from a new perspective. It's in life, you need new perspective to everything because it will help you to create a balance. Because Absolutely. everybody has been complaining. They're not complaining because they don't like you. They're, not, they're complaining because they're not seeing the desired result. They're not seeing the impact of your ministry. Your ministry, as a minister, you are meant to put directions, uh, ensure implementations, so that the people can feel the impact of the governance. And we're not feeling that as much. And it's the people now pushing the government to the direction in which the government should go in as much. Even when the government says we're going to do X, the people are now putting a lot of pressure on them to ensure that they fulfill those promises. You know, it's, it becomes needless if you have to put push somebody to do what he has promised and he has the capability, he has a skill set, he has the resources to achieve. Okay, yeah, can and, you and, complete and, your thoughts? And, and, so and, and I think increasingly gets case as well. With Labour, whether it's with Labour, whether it's with ASU, he doesn't have a very, doesn't seem to have a very good reputation with them anyway. So, and let's, let's assume for argument's sake, let's say Atiku had won the elections. There would be a new Labour minister, and you'd still have to. So he's still going to come there with fresh eyes, anyway. And so I don't believe he's the right person. I mean, when you forget, let's forget minimum wage. His comments about um, Nigerian doctors saying that we're exporting doctors, it's fine. We have more than enough doctors. Is one of the most irresponsible things I've ever heard from a government minister in this country. That that is is ridiculous. That's why how he's still a minister, I don't understand it. So there are these, that's why, I, and that, I think that's part of what I mean by the list is underwhelming because if you're going to bring back these kinds of people, if you're going to bring back, and when I say bring back, I'm talking about someone like even Arab Beshola who was a governor or um, Gotula Pabio who was a governor and then a senator, it's the same set of people. So how, how did that list come up the next day? Yes, I understand that there are a lot of conversations because each state has to have um, a nominee and then the governors get involved and all those, I, I, I get all that. But okay. the point is, when you have the same set of people facing, dealing with the Nigeria's problems, you can't really have that much change in terms of I, results. I, I was actually honest. going to take you up on, um, you know, the people, the availability of needed <laughs> skills. Mm. Uh, but to mention names might be like it's yeah. a promotion because that's where I was headed mm. to ask you who would be alternative, who are the likely alternatives that would have been able to uh, fill in this shoe. But let's, let's move away from that and look at the unbundling of certain uh, ministries. We know that the Minister of Finance now has two additions to her portfolio, and that's uh, budget and national planning. And we also have uh, the unbundling for um, Fashola. He's yeah. now works and housing, while someone else, I think uh, Saleh Maman, is someone now the of Minister power. of Power. Yeah. We know about Fashola. We know about Zainab. And, but we, we also know that power is a very critical um, sector in this country. What do we know really about this guy and his ability to perform? Yeah, but, so I don't know a lot about him, to be honest, but I think it makes sense to have removed power from, because power works and housing were never always together. Um, President Buhari was one that did that, and I think doing that spoke to the trust he had in um, former Governor Fashola to do that. But the reality is that Power is such, like you said, is such a critical um, component of everything. Everything else rests on that, really. So it makes sense for that to be separate, have a minister dedicated solely to that. And whether it's Fashola, whether it's the new guy, whether, whoever, whoever it is, I think it just makes a lot of sense that that's their sole focus. And, and Fashola can focus on works and housing, which, as far as I'm concerned, he did a very good job on anyway. If his, I don't know if you would call them KPIs, would be dragged down, it would be because power has sort of fluctuated over the last, there were periods when it improved, there were periods when it went back down. And 
so yeah, I, I, I get that a, a, a good chunk of that is probably not not has not that much to do with him. Well, whether whether or not he's doing a good job, but it just means that it's such like you said, it's such a critical component of what we do in the country that that has to have its own its own uh, ministry. So I don't know a lot about the guy. By I like the fact that that's been taken, taken away, away from, from, Fashola. from Fashola. Let me take you on the aviation sector. We have the return of Hadi Sirika. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that there was, I think one of the biggest things during this administration's first run was the new Nigeria Air that was supposed to come on board. But for some reason, that story became very skewed. So do you see his return and the likelihood of the... Um, flights taking off, the new Nigeria Air taking off, do you see them as a possibility? Well, him coming back, I think um, it, we can give it a chance. His, his back is there to, to function in that capacity. Uh, I see him righting the wrong of the past because during this term, if you want to read his performance last time, uh, the domestic flights reduced in, in traffic flight and all those things and the, 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 the Air Nigeria, you know, Yes, the promise that it was going to happen, I didn't happen. This is the, another opportunity for him to now begin to set the right direction. Because one of the things that you are measured by as a, as a country in the aviation sector is your international and your domestic. In terms of international, we are in, in partnership with other international airlines. But for our domestic, which is his base, you know, that it should have functioned much more, to, way better in the first uh, Term. That didn't happen as much as we expected. Yeah, it was only grace of God that we didn't suffer so uh, ill fate in the air and all those things. But as God we have it, I think this is a, this is another opportunity for him to begin to look at how it's going to shape the outlook of Nigeria in the aviation sector because we need as a country now to begin to look at how better because Nigeria is a major hub for West Africa and even for Sub-Saharan Africa. And Ghana is trying to take that response, uh, that uh, traffic flow away from, from Lagos. Us. So we need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, espouse and entrench and, uh, uh, you know, enlarge that opportunity so that the economy of Nigeria can improve. Because when that happens, then the regulatory, uh, the regulatory performance in that sector will improve. Take up our airports, except for Lagos and Abuja and uh, Polakot. Major airports are not still doing. They are not fantastic. If you compare ourselves to the Kotaka Airport in Ghana, that was just that was developed not too long ago, and what we have, you ask ourselves the questions: Where is our budget going into? So we need to leapfrog and make our you know aviation sector more safe because that's the key thing that is fundamental for our people, so that they can they can fly with their eyes closed, you know. Peace of mind. All right, let, let me ask you uh, again. This might be an overreach, but is it possible to adduce some of the reasons why the ministers that were in uh, government didn't deliver on their promises? That, for instance, the, we'll get to him in a bit. We'll get to him in a bit. I'd ask the Minister of Education. There is a, a whole lot of issues yeah. on that. But what could be the reason? for them not to deliver on promises that they made and how can that be tweaked now so that this set of ministers will perform at least above average this time around because this is the last tenor of Buhari's administration. Yeah, I think, um, I think the thing is that um, we need to be careful when we listen to politicians and their promises because when I mean, it's no secret that Nigeria has had issues for a very long time. And it's, it, it almost sounds, I think it's ridiculous to the point of absurd when you start to hear, I'll fix X and X in two years, I'll fix electricity in 60 days, you, and you start to hear all these things. And I mean, it's not rocket science. Things that have been damaged for decades, things that have been problems for years, it doesn't take, in some cases, it doesn't, it doesn't take one term to fix some of these problems. But where, where I think hope starts to come is when you can see that even though the problems haven't been fixed, you can at least see progress. 
then you start to think, okay, yes, it's not been fixed, but we can see what is happening. When I mentioned the two ministers that I was optimistic about, Fashola and Zainab Ahmed, I should have mentioned um, Rotimi Amici as well. Because to be honest, I've been impressed with what he's done in terms of transportation and rails and all those sorts of things as well. So yes, has uh, have those problems been fixed? No, they haven't. But you can see the progress that is being made. And so I think for Nigerians, it's not so much, we, need, we just need to be careful when we start to hear, by my first term, this is going to happen, my first tenure as minister, X and X is going to happen. You need to ask yourself, A, is that actually possible for that to happen? And even if it's possible, obviously there's the so-called Nigerian factor in everything that we do here. And that's a major factor. We can't pretend that it's not. So I think it's easier to be disappointed when you have certain expectations. But at the same time, when you start to see results, when you start to see that, okay, this is happening, that looks like there's progress here or there, and then yes, there, there is, there's, there's more than enough reason to be, to be optimistic or to be hopeful. But um, for me, it's just, uh, I, I don't know what they are. I'm not going to say I know exactly what the reasons are, why they haven't delivered. But f it's, I think a major factor is the fact that it's either they went as prepared as they were for how bad things were, in which case it would be harder to fix them or it would take longer to fix them. And don't forget that they came in just a few months before there was a recession, or a major recession, which obviously had an imp no, had at least impact. That's the credit. Well. They were able to take us out of recession, even yeah, though some people say yeah. the pace is rather slow. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you look anywhere in the world, recessions don't end overnight. Japan was in a, in a, in a recession for 10 years. They call it the lost decade in, in Japan. They were in a recession for 10 <laughs> years. So it's not, and yeah, they're fine now. But my point is, it's not, Coming out of recession is never a quick, there's no quick solution to it. It's, it's that simple. Yeah, so I give them credit for the fact that they were able to do that. But the way recessions happen, anyway, recessions happen around the world. Anyone who knows anything about economics understands that it doesn't, it, recessions don't happen because one president became, because someone became president yesterday. It's something that would have, some things, so a number of things would have happened over a period of time. I think President Buhari was just unfortunate that he happened to be president at the time. So it doesn't matter if Buhari was there, if Atiku was there, if Jonathan was there, the recession would have still happened at that time. All right, let's, let's just get your concluding thoughts on this. Your, what, what could have hampered the deliverables and how can they tweak it to be better? The, the, I think from my point of view, a lot of things hampered their, their deliverable. The first on the table is the budget. Uh, when you have a budget that it has been signed into law half year, and you want to achieve what you set for yourself from January to December. It, it means that you've lost half of the period in which you need to implement that one. Then the resource, the resource allocation. The resource allocation, from my point of view, is a challenge because they keep, yeah, resource is scarce, but they keep juggling. But when the budget is, is upfront and signed, take for instance, one of the things we need to get right as, uh, as a government in Nigeria is to ensure that we align ourselves with the fiscal year, with fiscal policy. Because when the fiscal policy is a direction for the government of the day to be able to see, because when we begin to ask ourselves, how do we hold them accountable? The only document that is social contract between the citizen and government every year is a document. It's a policy document, which is the budget. From the budget, we know how much is available to each of the ministries and what have you. And we can begin to say, and they themselves can begin to break it down to say, okay, how much of this can I utilize to achieve X, Y, Z has been set on the table. And if you notice at the end of the year, they have a lot of unutilized fund. And, you know, which means a resource to it if uh, you know is available, but they are not utilizing based on a lot of procedural challenges, system challenges, and what have you. I must say thank you very much, gentlemen, for your contributions on the program thank thus far. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go on a short break, and when we come back, I'll be joined by another set of guests, and we'll be looking at prospects and agenda setting for our economy. Just stay with us.